Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Graying Jedi Podcast. These are the Jedi Council Chambers. Joining me, Urza Master, as always, Jedi Master Cilia Maz and Lord Uther. Gentlemen, welcome. We embark once again on a journey with the Mandalorian. In this week's episode, the minds of Mandalore were reunited with another familiar face who joins the episode quite predominantly, and we get to see Jawas. So, I'm going to throw this one over to Jedi Master Cilia Maz, because I think there's a, there's a lot to talk about here. So, Cilia Maz, enlighten us. Thank you, Jedi Master Urza Master. Thank you, Jedi Master Lord Uther. And thanks, Grain Jedi fans, as we continue our journey through Season 3 of The Mandalorian. Uh, this is Chapter 18, for those of you keeping score at home. Uh, the Minds of Mandalore, and it first aired on March 8th. 2023. Our director is actually a cinematographer by trade, uh, but what she really wanted to do was direct. Uh, Rachel Morrison. She was the first woman to earn an Academy Award nomination for cinematography for her work on the 2017 film Mudbound, which not a lot of people saw because it was actually shot for uh, Netflix. This is in the wild, wild west days of, of streaming and so forth, pre-pandemic, but the picture had a limited theatrical release and then made most of its hay on the, the streamer, who at that time was branching out from merely acquiring content and was starting to produce its own, like Stranger Things and Emily in Paris and, and all those fun shows you like to tune into. Uh, but Mudbound earned Rachel Morrison. Uh, she was the first woman in Hollywood history to be able to be nominated as a cinematographer. Uh, before and after that accomplishment, uh, she worked with uh, Ryan Coogler. Uh, she did the well-received 2013 film Fruitvale Station with Michael B. Jordan, which was based on the true story of a young man who was killed in a San Francisco BART uh, stop, uh, and so the film explored sort of the racial divide and uneven uh, asymmetry in Oakland, California. So she shot that for Ryan, and then she also shot the original Black Panther in 2018. <clears throat> so she has worked with Ryan uh, in and out of the MCU. Uh, and of course the writer is showrunner, producer, director, John Favreau. Who else? Uh, would give us uh, such a such an episode. I'm sure that Dave Filoni <coughs> uh, helped uh, because this one is steeped in Mandalorian lore and some of it taken directly from Filoni's animated works, Star Wars Rebels and The Clone Wars. Uh, and we had uh, a couple of familiar faces joining Din Djarin and, and Grogu this week. Uh, it looks like Bo-Katan Kreese, played by the uh, inimitable Katie Sackhoff, is going to be hanging around Season 3. So much so that uh, she might have been added to the regular cast if this was Law & Order or ER or so forth. Uh, but she's definitely not just a flash-in-the-pan guest star cameo. Uh, she's got some business to take care of, and, and we welcome her for it. Uh, and Amy Sedaris, who is just dropping in for guest star bits, uh, returns as Tatooine uh, fixer Peli Moto. Uh, and I loved, uh, I loved the little scam. It, on the surface, fairly obvious, but I love the scam of forcing customers to pay for repairs that the Jawas themselves have caused the mischief. Uh, the old bait and switch at the uh, car repair shop. Uh, it never gets old, and it was clever here to see it. All right, hurry up before he gets back. Put those parts back in, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, if, if Amy Sedaris had her own spinoff show, I don't know uh, how invested one might be in, in 30 minutes of, of repairing pod racers and starships, all that tomfoolery. But in small doses, it, it works very well. Uh, and she comes through as and as eccentric but likable supporting character. And we had Boonta Eve, uh, first referenced in The Phantom Menace. 
Obviously, it's not just a pod race, uh, but it's a week of celebrations, dazzling fireworks, and that's one of uh, the series, not just the seasons, but the series' best visuals, having the Naboo N1 Starfighter rising off into the night sky surrounded by incandescent uh, explosions of light and color. Uh, that was really, really uh, a strong visual in a series that, that specializes in it. But kudos to ILM and everybody who worked on that sequence. That was very cool. Um, we get a little geography lesson of the Mandalore system, including the planet that Din Djarin himself was raised on, the Concordia moon, as well as Kevala, which is the moon where Bo-Katan usually spends her days moping uh, on her throne. Doesn't seem to be uh, very productive. Uh, each time we've seen her this season, she's just kind of sitting there with that pouty look and her leg kicked up on the side of the throne uh, as if she's just completed her day's tasks or just can't find the energy to get them started either way. Um, and there were some other visual callbacks or clues that I enjoyed here. The, the green crystallized world of Mandalore, the ruined surface. I got a Superman Returns. Lex Luthor created a whole... Uh, world of kryptonite i just thought of that or the fortress of solitude for that matter the jagged crystalline surfaces so that was a nice little visual there and once we went into the actual mines and, and below i mean this is mines of moria this is peter jackson all the way you know the ruined civilization subterranean so at no point did i think that star wars uh in these contexts was sort of you know, getting lazy and just riff, you know, riffing on existing material. It actually just made it, it gave me a quick frame of reference. And I'm just like, yeah, okay, that's cool. Um, and this episode, quite honestly, it's not that a lot happens, but it's a lot of atmosphere. And maybe that's befitting a director who works as a cinematographer. This is their, their they do it once a season so far, their spooky episode. Uh, last season, as you recall, in Chapter 10, right after the season premiere with uh, Cobb Vanth and the Curat Dragon, they had Din Djarin and the Egg Lady and Grogu uh, getting pursued by X-Wings and crashing on the ice planet and encountering those spiders, which would terrify grown Star Wars viewers, let alone the Wee Fry. Uh, and that was the second episode chapter of Season 2. Uh, we talked about it here on the on the old uh, Warp Core 24. Um, and this is the second episode of season three. And we have we have some spooky stuff, right? We have cave dwellers, uh, you know, straight out of Land of the Lost, giving our heroes a, a hard time. Uh, and we have this evil spider thing creature, you know, with a with a cyclopean eye. Uh, reminded me of, of Flash Gordon when Flash is running around Arborea and gets swallowed by the the swamp spider briefly before Prince Baron uh, rescues him. So it, uh, some fun callbacks, intentional or otherwise, for a science fiction fan such as this one. But again, in terms of like moving the plot forward, really the episode is all about, you know, returning to Mandalore, establishing the look, the the shadows, the creepy crevices and so forth, getting through various obstacles. I know that Lord Uther and Urza Master do a lot of gaming from time to time. So this had the the feel of, you know, clearing levels and, you know, getting from point A to point B to point C and so forth, you know, fulfill your quests, if you will. Uh, getting us to our destination, which is the, the waters, the living waters beneath the mines. Uh, and then this is the, you know, I've seen this episode several times. At first I thought it was kind of like the trash compactor on the Death Star that Din Djarin had somehow, you know, been yanked under and was fighting for his life beneath the surface. And that causes Bo-Katan to leap in and save him. But no, he just, he just took a, a step and was like, whoops. And then just plummeted a long, long, long way down. And she still had to go and rescue him. But it was more of a of a klutzy move rather than anything sinister beneath the waves, like trying to like you know eat him, or so forth. It just he's 
I'm walking, I'm, I'm getting baptized, I feel, whoa, watch that step. Uh, and for someone who is refreshingly secular and not very into the, the Din Djarin, this is the way creed, uh, we give a, a test of faith with Bo as she maybe perhaps glimpses the uh, fabled mythosaur, which is a, a keystone of their religion. I mean, it would be like a modern day pilgrim seeing a religious figure or a burning bush or some sign of the hereafter and having to wrestle with that right away. Did I just see that? Does that make any sense in my ordered universe? How does that change my belief system? You know, does it do so instantly? Does it, do I have to like, you know, ponder it? And we'll get answers to those questions during this season with Bo-Katan later. But it's a great, it's a great cliffhanger to end the episode on uh, for certain. And, you know, this is a painful homecoming. And I think rewatching this, I think that comes through a lot in Katie Sackhoff's performance. It doesn't just become moping you see there's a level of sadness as she sees this once great civilization that she and her family were the leaders of and which flourished. You know, Mandalore was not portrayed in the animated series, uh, you know, exclusively as a warlike bounty hunting, you know, let's conquer the galaxy and here's our home base. I mean, they had, you know, culture and music and literature and law and gardens. And, and it was... Again, it was a place that you'd want to raise a family in, and now it's been raised uh, to destruction uh, by the cruel callousness of the totalitarian uh, imperial state. And so even if the show doesn't spend 40 minutes, you know, facing that, you know, with, with sort of on the nose, you, it, it's suggested and we, it's ellipsed and we can get it. And it comes through very well, as well as that split between do I believe? I mean, for Din Djarin, this is it. It doesn't matter what obstacles are in his way. He's got to get to the waters. It doesn't matter. In fact, he says to Bo-Katan, you can just, you know, I don't even have a ship, but I don't care. You know, I, I, you don't need to wait around for me. I'm going down there. And she's like, fine, I'll take you. It's just a bunch of water until it's not. Uh, so I thought all of that came through very well. So as an episode where it was full of galactic exposition or things like that, we'll get episodes like that coming forward in this season. But this one was all about the chills. It would have fit right in if it had aired in October instead of March. Uh, and it just really kind of gave you that sort of creepy, you know, turn on the, the camera lights and, and don't pick that helmet up. It's a trap. Uh, so what did you guys think as we spelunked into the minds of Mandalore? Oh, okay. <clears throat> I mean, yes, it had all the things that you wanted, right? Um, I will say this with this episode. <laughs> excuse me. It puts R2-D2 in a completely different light. And, and, and what I mean by that is it makes you realize or understand why he is epic in a sense and why he is so instrumental and important because... We continue to come across droids or astromech droids that just don't have the same <laughs> savviness or presence. The right stuff. That R2, yeah, that R2-D2 seems to have. I mean, there were several times I was like, where's R2 when you need him? Like, he would have fit in perfectly helping out uh, Mando with this. Um, I don't know why we always leave Grogu alone. I, I always try and figure that out, though it, it works here. And... You know, for for our viewers, if you have not seen Battlestar Galactica, Katie Sackhoff is just, she's amazing. I mean, she's she takes on every role. You can tell that she falls in love with those characters in the sense of they become her. Like, you, you can't think of, it's kind of like Han Solo, well, I shouldn't say that because I liked the guy who played Han Solo in Solo, but, right, like, your your mind gets, you have these images burned in there and she's, absolutely perfect <clears throat> for bo, bo -Katan. Um The other thing that I thought was interesting was, you know, just seeing how she handles the dark saber versus oh, yeah. obviously him still struggling with it. Oh, yeah. um, you know, and, and 
the last piece I'll kind of lean into a little bit here is we see the mythosaur. It's kind of interesting because though I would like to see Grogu at some point controlling that mythosaur, because I think that would be unstoppable, we kind of get a vision of what it would be like for Mando to possibly be riding the mythosaur because he was, wasn't he riding the Rancor in... Boba. Boba Fett, or was that Boba Fett riding the Rancor? No, no, it was. It was. Ginger, no, no, it was Boba Fett. You're right. You're right. It was Boba. I, well, so I guess in a sense we still kind of get a preview of what that could be like if we see, you know, Mando actually riding that Mythosaur, but on a much larger scale. And I like the idea of kind of her questioning, did she really see that or not? Right? Maybe possibly taking her down that path of becoming one of these. <sighs> Children of the night. Dedicated or old school Mandalorians versus what they've kind of morphed themselves into. Right. Stellar episode. One of the highlights of season three because I struggle with season three but uh, at different points, but this one is, is one for the books. And like we talk about, this is an episode I might show to someone that we, we would want to, them to get into the Mandalorian or get into the Star Wars universe in a sense. Um, so just, it's, it's great all around. Yeah. I, I think, I think that's the main point here is this is one of those episodes where I'd be like, Oh, you got to watch this one. Um, it's, and it's not like it's action, action packed. Like some of the episodes of Ahsoka where it's like, Oh, that, that was cool. It, this is more of a, this really invests you in the story of the Mandalorians um, and that you get a sense that, you know, cause they talk about Mandalore for forever and now you've seen it and it's like, wow, this, there's a lot of mystery here. Um, and to build mystery into star Wars is hard to do, frankly, cause most planets are just, they're just there for the Jedi to run around in, Right. Um, you know, but this has some real mythos. It has some real history. It has all these weird things going on. It's got the uh, alien-looking, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, cave-dwelling type creatures that look like the blue aliens from the time machine on, <laughs> on steroids. Um, and and Bo-Katan with the Darksaber, I mean, just feels right. And it just looks great. Um so I, I don't know. It, it makes me wonder where the series is heading with, with Bo-Katan and with um, Mando and Grogu, just because this is the first episode where I think I, I, I watched it and I was like, man, I don't I, like, are they going to bring back Mandalore or is this going to morph into something completely different that I'm not even aware of? And that's, that's the coolest thing about this episode. Now, about any of these episodes that are, I think, truly successful, it's how do you craft something in the Star Wars universe where you don't really know what's going to happen next? I really don't know how this is going to fit into the greater canon. Um, like with D23 happening this week and the new Mandalorian and Grogu trailer dropping, um, if some of you have seen the bootleg out there, I'd like to wait for the quality one, but who am I kidding? I had to watch it. Um, you know, even that, I still really don't know where they're headed. I mean, that looks like it could just be a like a Star Trek motion picture, you know, where it's one really long Mandalorian episode, which would be awesome. Totally great. Um, or is it, you know, more of a Tron Ares type deal where it's kind of a soft reboot of The Mandalorian and it's going to connect it to this bigger universe like we've been talking uh, with Ahsoka and with Skeleton Crew. And that that would be excellent as well. But quite frankly, it could go either way. Um, very, very exciting. Um, this episode specifically just introduces you to a lot of those non-Empire threats that exist in this universe. Like random big spider robot aliens. <laughs> Drain your blood. Never seen one in Star Wars before. Why not? It, it and it was great. Um, you know, it puts Din Djarin in a really like vulnerable position, which we haven't really seen thus far. Um, and the fact that Bo Katan kind of has to take care of him, she has to become a different type of leader in this episode, and that 
I think is the theme that they're setting up for this season is that you know these characters have to change and adapt and become greater than what they are and that's why she's in a malaise in her castle I think is because she's stuck in that way of like this is who I am but she needs to grow and maybe being bathed and cleansed in the waters of Lake Minnetonka is what she needed so I, I, I truly I had a great time watching this episode um, and it really wasn't the scope was very narrow is another odd thing for star Wars is like, this is a very not quite ship in a bottle type episode, but it's, it's super narrow, you know, like you're in one basic location the entire time. I mean, not, you know, a hundred percent of the way, but enough to where it's like, you feel like you're spelunking with them and, and encountering this odd, you know, subterranean world of Mandalore that it's like, is this, what was this like? It was the big question, you know, before the bombs, you know, what was, what, how did this society function? Cause it, it reminds me a bit of, um, rings of power where we finally get to see the dwarven city under the mountain and it's thriving and there's artifice going on. And, you know, there's these big, like dining halls where the, you know, the dwarf kings live and Elrond is there and you get to see all these like caverns and you know mithril being mined awesome I mean just tremendous like to see something you'd only heard about or seen like glimpses of in the Lord of the Rings and now with Mandalore we're getting the same thing we're, we're sort of seeing the glimpses of what this is really makes me wonder what this was and that's Look, I mean, Disney's going to make money on Star Wars for forever. That is something they could explore. The Mandalorian War. You know, that would be outstanding. I mean, to see the Empire versus Mandalore, that's a trilogy all on its own. I mean, we know how it ends, but who cares? Strange New Worlds is doing it. We know how Captain Pike's story ends. Uh, unless they do some sort of alternate universe switcheroo. Uh, which, to be honest, I'm kind of here for like I, I could see this being like a, a an interesting alternate timeline type deal, but they don't have to. They literally could end it the way we know it's going to end, and I'd be like, "All right, I'm good." Like that was awesome. <laughs> so, in, in, now you're making me think. Well, I have two questions for you guys, but I'm going to go back to this real quick because I think it's a great point. Stranger Worlds almost throws it in our face that you know what's going to happen to Pike in the first episode. Like this is what happens in a sense. And we're telling you that we know that you know this is what happens. And look what we're going to do anyway. Which is, again, just makes that series even better. Alright, two questions. First one. Do you want to see Bo-Katan be a part of the A-team that's going to, that we all hope, or at least I really hope, is put together to go after Thrawn? Oh, yeah. Do you want to see her be a part of that? Absolutely. Yes. No. She. A, she. She's a. Oh. She's an Avenger. I mean, if you will, if we're going to do Star Wars meets the Avengers, and get Ahsoka and Din Djarin and Boba Fett and Fennec Shand, yeah, it's like Bo Katan and any Mandal Mandalorian who wants to, you know, sixes or fives or whatever his name was, uh, wolves, yeah, bring them all on. Yes, absolutely. I. Uh... I wouldn't want her to be part of the main group. Um, I'd want her to be like the end game shows up to help seal the deal. Okay. Um, her and all of the Mandalores, uh, Mandalorians. Um, Ooh. I, I know we've talked Grogu being the leader of Mandalore. I'd really like to see Bo-Katan resume the throne. I think that's what they're going for. Honestly. Um, I would love to see her and a renewed, Mandalorian like core force show up in a battle against maybe not Thrawn directly. I could see Thrawn being involved because I think the Thrawn is really a trilogy. I think, I think the natural culmination of what we're getting right now, it would be against Moff Gideon and the defeat of Moff Gideon would be your first movie. And then the retaliation would be your second movie. You know, it's the, the same formula as the original trilogy. Uh, I think that would be great, frankly. Do all right. Do you want to see this become an MCU thing 
because that's kind of what we're leaning into a little bit here where all these separate shows or movies are they going to come together for a Thrawn trilogy or is that what you want to see so we can either play the prediction game or we can play the what what do you want to see I don't it's up to you guys like what do you want what do you want to see happen yeah. I'd love to see an MCU style collab I, I think that's very successful and for the reasons we're all too you know uh, proud of ourselves to admit we just we love fan service we, all fans do I, I love seeing the crew come together in Endgame and Infinity War you know I just don't want to see anybody get reduced to just a bit part who has earned a bigger part like Bo Katan, I think, could be you know, not quite the savior of the story, but make you know be the tide turner and, and, and step up and take you know a, a bigger role in like a second and maybe a third movie. Um, but I, I do think that there are some bit players that you know could come in and and be their same bit playing characters, like uh, Amy Sedaris's character. I think would be great to see in an ensemble movie. You know, after a you know, a, a ship to ship battle to start the movie or something. And now they're all on Tatooine and they have to sort of regroup and figure out what their next move is. And then all of a sudden, you know, Thrawn shows up at Tatooine. Um, that'd be great. I mean, that, that would be awesome. I do think that the one thing you might run into is budget constraints. And I hate to say it as such, but I, I think that's just the reality of some of these films like it, it would be awesome, awesome, awesome to see all these folks coming together. But I feel like you're only going to be able to pay so much money. And I don't think we're going to see a billion dollar budget for a Star Wars movie again. I just don't think that's going to happen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make, go ahead. Or, I think uh, I, I, silly mask. Your, I have one more point to make. To your, yeah. To your, to your thing about team ups. I mean, comic book fans worldwide and for many generations have thrilled when Superman and Spider-Man crossed over entire publishing yeah. arms and got together. And how many times did Reed Richards and the Fantastic Four team up with the X-Men or Iron Fist and Power Man? Or, I mean, team-ups are what this whole enterprise has been built on, you know, so to speak. So, yes, enterprise. I think it's inevitable that we get that, but I think to Jedi Master Ursa Master's point, you know, you don't want to just see Ahsoka, you know, pop in for a two scene bit, you know, do some do some quick, you know, laughs with with Jude Law from Skeleton Crew, turn on a lightsaber, slash a few things, and then, you know, she's out. Because we spend time with Ahsoka and, and getting to know her character and so forth. So yes, it's the ability to try and parcel out you know who's who's going to be the singular focus of this proposed Mandoverse trilogy or or films or series of films? Who's whose point of view are we following? Because they're you know just like the Star Trek features, it was always the big three, and then everything else kind of branched out. And if we have to reduce some of these characters to slightly smaller roles, how do we still get invested? How did the people who support Ahsoka and Jude Law and his unnamed Jedi character? How do they get their money's worth without feeling like, oh, yeah, uh, you know, they just popped in, you know, for their... Think, think of how they handled Worf in First Contact. He'd already split to go to another television show, and they worked him back in, and he had a great, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one with Picard, you know, get off of my bridge. Um, that's that's the right way to do it, and it's been done before successfully. And I'm sure Favreau and Filoni have, have got their uh, have got their instincts to to follow. Uh, but that's what you're looking for is is a, a nice balance. so great. We we need great writing. Yes. is what we're getting at. Got it. Okay, last question, and then I'll I'll stop. Or maybe it's a thought. Or you know what? Tell me what you think about this. I I'm obviously so focused on the idea of having three movies with Thrawn. If that was to happen, and I think we've all kind of alluded to that, that's something we like to see. So let's pretend it happens. I, I'm going to make a statement that I think it could be one of the most pivotal trilogies or one of the most pivotal sets of movies that we've seen come out of the Star Wars universe. 
because if it's written correctly, it could change, which is what we're kind of leaning into with Ahsoka a little bit, it could change the path of Star Wars, maybe not change it, how about this, um, just take it in a new direction, which to me isn't change, I think those are two different things. So, thoughts on that, and then I'll stop talking. Well, yeah, I mean, th this takes place after Return of the Jedi and before the sequel trilogy. And some people, you know, would just prefer that the sequel trilogy uh, disappear into the multiverse. That That's not going to happen. Uh, so, I mean, given that we know where the story is going 35 years down the road, how do we position ourselves, as you say, to to allow for new branches to grow, new leaves uh, and buds to shoot from the tree, the the ancient tree of knowledge that was uh, uh, struck by lightning in The Last Jedi. Um, how do we allow for that room to grow? And can that give the people who are going to follow the sequel trilogy with our new Ray movie and so forth, how will they say, you know what, here's an interesting place we can go and I think we've been shown the way. This is the way. Uh, and so we're not just going to rehash old tropes and, and tired memes. Uh, we are going to try something different with this new Jedi Academy and the challenges that Rey faces, for example, in, in setting it. It's not just going to be, well, you know, Luke had trouble with one of his star pupils and it all went to hell. Uh, how do we tell an interesting, unusual tale of that? You know, st how do you actually start a Jedi Academy? Like... Again, who comes up with the lesson plans? We have teachers in the building. Um, what, you know, we've seen Luke attempting to teach Grogu. We've seen Yoda attempting to teach Luke. But can you take it further? Can there be even things, you know, can there be like moral and ethical, you know, questions? You know, is it a written exam? Is it open book? I mean, let's, we can really get into the, 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 the web of it. Uh, from a practical boots on the ground, you know, butts in the classroom kind of thing. Classrooms, Jedi classrooms. So there's there's a lot there. Uh, and but like to your point, tell like you say, take it in a new direction. And if you have to kind of detour around the sequel trilogy for those that that weren't a fan of that, uh, this viewer is not one of those people. But if you have to take some slight detours and side ramps and and so forth, then have the creative freedom to do it and and don't feel like I'm I've been pigeonholed or penciled in or boxed in by anything that has come before. Yes. <laughs> to steal a line from Lord Uther. Um no I I uh I couldn't agree more. I, I think the beauty is we do know where this is going. It 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 does unfortunately lead to the Rise of Skywalker. Um, that being said, I do think you can totally circumnavigate the sequel trilogy. Uh, we've we've demonstrated that there is the great continuum of life beyond that Anakin was able to come back in the Ahsoka series. So I think there's, and, and of course, some of these aliens have very long lifespans. I mean, Boba Fett might be, you know, the clones might have like super long lifespans if they aren't shot. <laughs> so, or chopped in half or whatever. Um, you know, that leads me to believe that like, you know, we, we could just see all of these characters in a post, you know, Ray movie because why not? I mean, there's no, you know, there's no real definition around them that much that, you know, we couldn't uh, get away with doing something like that. Um, Likewise, I, I think I think the beauty is they have enough passionate writers that they can make basically anything they want to have happen happen. Um, and you can set up a, a future state cast like with Skeleton Crew where, you know, a, one of these kids might be one of the, you know, trainees at the Jedi Academy and, and you know, whatever. Or a couple of them or, you know, maybe that's their whole goal is like, they're trying to survive and one of them ends up being force sensitive and discovered by Luke Skywalker and they get saved from something at the very end of the series. I, I could see that. Um, that might be exactly what happens, uh, which wouldn't be bad. I mean, honestly, that's the thing is like, I, that could 
be very cool to then bring that to a Jedi, but Jedi Academy miniseries or movie or whatever. Um, I think my one cautionary tale I would say is that you only have so much time left with some of the core actors that need to be in these roles. And we learned that with Balin Skull, unfortunately. That story, I think, is the most compelling of the Ahsoka series. And, you know, with The Mandalorian, I think I think Bo-Katan's story is among the most compelling. To be honest, these actors only have so many years that they're going to want to do it, and only so many years they're actually going to be able to do it, and then so many years they're able to do voiceovers, like Mark Hamill with Luke Skywalker. Um, you know, not to be morbid, but he's going to die eventually. Like, we all do, unless he's found the path to it eternal life like Qui-Gon Jinn um, which I hope so but um, you know I, I I just think that there needs to be a little urgency around rallying together this hodgepodge crew that's going to make this big trilogy or these big movies um, and not this is going to sound bad I don't mean it to sound negative but not waste time on a Ray series where Ray's Daisy Ridley's pretty young We've got plenty of years left with her to make that series happen and make it truly exceptional. Some of these other actors, you know, they're already in their 40s, you know. So we, you know, in 20 years, we're not likely to be making a Bo-Katan series. I, I mean, unless, you know, it's Bo-Katan at the helm and then a bunch of young people are actually doing the work. Um, I, I think about some of the uh, great action heroes of the 80s who would make awesome cameos in Star Trek. But look at uh, like Jean-Claude Van Damme. Amazing in double impact. But nowadays, still great in the movies he does, but he's in them for like 11 minutes. And the rest of the movie is an hour and 50 minutes of bit players and young people you've never heard of. Some of them are good. Some of them are not good. <laughs> uh, some of them, it's the best 11 minutes of the movie. Um, so I, you know... I just don't want to see it get boiled down to something like that for Star Wars, where it's like, we need to make an Ahsoka series uh, movie, but Rosario Dawson is 70, and, you know, she can only get into, like, 30 minutes of, of a, of a two-and-a-half-hour-long movie. Like, mm, that's not going to work for me. Right. Not if it's an Ahsoka movie. Now, if it's a Ahsoka comes back as a Force ghost, you know, and, and talks to a Padawan 50 years in the future, cool. I think that'd be great, but I digress. We have kyber crystals to give to this season three, episode two of The Mandalorian, a rating. And gentlemen, if I may, I, I have no visual aid today. Uh, I'm going to give this one a green. Uh, I really enjoyed this episode, especially the first time I watched it. It's the first time we see Mando in a very compromised position and needing to be saved. And Bo-Katan is absolutely stunning in this episode. Just an outstanding performance. Not to mention the fact she comes across as almost, I want to say maternal, but it's almost like a vague love interest pitch where she's sort of taking care of Din Djarin. She's kind of like, you've never had this soup before? My goodness. <laughs> Let me make you more soup. <laughs> I, like, I don't know. I, like, I know it, it'd be a weird swing, but I, I would love to see that love story play out. Maybe because I really enjoy Bo-Katan. But at the same time, I think it would be cool. I think Grogu would kind of fit right into that as like their, their child sort of situation. Um, so Disney writers, I know you're watching. That is an idea. You can have it. Uh, I'll just take $50 million. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, that's that's the vibe I was getting. By the way, I definitely felt like there's, and we might, and I think we see a little bit more of that later on. But if they went that way, I would not argue with it. So Ooh. it gets a green. I totally bought into this episode, nice. and um, unfortunately, I would sell some of the later episodes, but I would buy this episode for a dollar. So nice reference. I loved it. Nice, gentlemen. What's in the box? What's in the box? It's another great Mandalorian episode. Uh, uh, and for all the reasons that we've gone into and so forth, uh, 
I I loved I loved the the naturalness with uh, Bo Katan uh, when Grogu just shows up unannounced, you know, and she's just like, you know, download the droid, find out where they went. Like she just she just on a flips a switch on a dime and becomes that cool, calm, collected leader. And, you know, she interacts with Grogu, you know, did you think, you know, your father was the only Mandalorian? And I love that Din Djarin, when he's teaching him navigation, again, he doesn't see him as a weird little green guy who, you know, can move things around with his mind. He's like, if we're going to be Mandalorians, you need to learn navigation and you need to learn, you know, how to fly a starship. And like, he's basically just saying, you're one of us now. You're part of the children of the night. Uh, you know, you, you and I, for all intents and purposes, are the same pilgrims, even though, you know, obviously by species and stature, it's a completely different animal. And we'll see that played out later this season as well. But just the idea that in Din Djarin's mind, Grogu is a true foundling. He's not just some like, okay, well, now I'm stuck with the kid and I can't get a babysitter. What do I do? Like, he's just accepted him naturally. You know, you're one of us. Join us. And so I kind of love that. And and I love that the episode doesn't make a big deal out of it. It's just, this is how, this is the way. So, yes, uh, we're back to green, uh, graying Jedi fans. I, I knew you were despairing over the past week, but uh, we are safely back in an emerald shimmer. And uh, I think we owe that to Bo-Katan. Uh, huge fan right here, this, <laughs> this guy. Um, I... I I can't stress enough that uh, the Mandalorian has yet to disappoint. Um, I have watched this season before, so I don't want to spoil anything, but I don't know that Lord Uther and I are going to agree on some of these future episodes because I had a pretty favorable overview of what happened. So before we get too deep into those weeds, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button for us Make sure you stay up to date with the Graying Jedi Council because we have some very exciting things. These are the podcast episodes you're looking for. And may the Force be with you.